Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 123 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Pretty much anyone with an interest in the Middle Ages, and even loads of people with no interest whatsoever, has heard the name Geoffrey Chaucer. Much ink has been spilled on his life, his influence, his poetry, and how he navigated the court politics of the 14th century. But there's another Chaucer that should be showing up on our radar as well, both as part of political circles and even tangentially as part of literary circles. Alice Chaucer. I recently came across an anguished tweet lamenting the fact that there were no podcasts anywhere apparently which featured this influential countess. So, like your very own medieval Batgirl, I answered the call. This week, I spoke with Michelle Schindler, author of a couple of forthcoming books on the extended Chaucer family, including Alice. Michelle's first book is Lovell Our Dog, The Life of Viscount Lovell, Closest Friend of Richard III and Failed Regicide. And her forthcoming books are De La Pole, Father and Son, The Duke, The Earl, and The Struggle for Power. And What is Better Than a Good Woman, Alice Chaucer, Commoner and Yorkist Matriarch. Here's our conversation on Alice's life, how she navigated the tricky world of 15th century England, and why Michelle thinks everyone should get to know her. Well, thank you, Michelle, for joining me to talk about Alice Chaucer. Hello. I heard your voice crying out on Twitter saying no one is talking about Alice Chaucer on podcast, so I decided to swoop to the rescue, and we will talk about Alice Chaucer today. So the obvious question is, is Alice related to Geoffrey Chaucer? Yes. Let's start there. Yes, she is. She's his granddaughter, actually. His only known granddaughter. He had several children, but we only know of one child his oldest son, Thomas, had. And that's Jeffrey, then Thomas, and then Alice. Great. And Thomas was kind of a storied person in his own life, wasn't he? He was kind of a, an important person, at least locally. Yes, yes, he was. And he was... Well, he was always at the fringes of court, so to speak. He he lent money to both Henry IV and Henry V, but he was never politically all that important. He was just some sort of regional power, but quite popular. Very, <laughs> uh, he was uh, he was running this this household with poets, and people would uh, flock to him for for parties and that sort of thing. <laughs> I think that it would be good to know Thomas Chaucer, even if he wasn't directly royal, because some people might not know this, the Chaucer family actually had some royal connections, didn't they? Yes, not by blood, but Thomas Chaucer's mother, so Alice's grandmother, was uh, Philippa Swinford, and that's the sister of Catherine Swinford, who married John of Gaunt and then became the mother of the Beauforts. And therefore also, I think it's the great-great-grandmother of Henry VII, Maybe I'm missing a crate, but so literally Thomas's uncle by marriage was a prince. That yes. kind of God. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so that is a very handy relationship to have when John of Gaunt's son takes the throne in 1399. So that kind of brought the Trotters pretty close to the center of things, even if they weren't right in the court themselves. Now they were also the same age. That's, that's Henry IV and Thomas Chaucer and it. We can't know exactly, but Thomas's rise coincides very, very neatly with Henry the Fourth taking the throne. So there's probably a connection there. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you start to dig into the relationships that people are having, intermarriages and cousins and all that kind of stuff, when it comes to the royal court, you find so many connections. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. So Alice is born to Thomas. It's 1404 that she's born, isn't it? So tell us a little bit about what's going on in 1404 when Alice is born. Well, of course, there was still quite a lot of upheaval in England because Henry IV had only just taken the throne five years earlier. There were several rebellions against him going on at that time. Thomas Chaucer was always, so that's Alice's father, was always very involved in putting them down and giving the king money to to help uh, suppress the rebels, that sort of thing. He was also Speaker of the Parliament, by the way, five times for the Commons, of course. Which was a historical record for quite some time. <laughs> yes. Interestingly, Alice's third husband was William de la Pole, that's the Earl of Suffolk, and William's father had originally gone against Henry IV and, and lost his earldom and only later then regained it again. Yes, we need to get to the Delapoles later because that's a huge part of Alice's story. So Alice is growing up. She's got a pretty well-known father. How are things for her 
as she begins to grow up because it doesn't take her long before she gets involved in grown up activities, is it? No, not at all. Um, this was quite common at the time, but Alice too married very early. She was only like 10, maybe even nine. Uh, she married in between 14 and 1415. And she married a, a man much older than her, as was also quite common, that's John Philip, who was uh, a friend of Henry V. Actually, Henry himself described him as his friend. But they never lived together, of course. But he was quite uh, generous to her. He set his entire estate, uh, estate on her. And in his will, he left her also quite a lot. So when he died in 1415, she was 11 years old and very, very rich. <laughs> <laughs> which is handy, which is handy in the Middle Ages. Yeah, it was common for noble ladies to get married fairly early, but still 10 is very early. So and I Alice imagine... wasn't technically noble, so that's very interesting too. So it was quite a match for her. Uh, Philip wasn't actually noble himself. He was a member of the gentry, but his brother was to become Lord Bardolf. So that's quite a connection to the nobility. And of course, he was close to Henry V. So when she was a widow at a ridiculously young age, she had many connections already. Yes. So this must have been an important match for people at the time. So there's probably things going on that we will never know about for such a young, young marriage, because you were usually looking at 13, 14. So she's widowed at the age of 11. She's super rich. She has no children because, well, I'm hoping that they didn't actually consummate that marriage yet. Usually if people got married that young, they didn't right away. So she's a widow. She's super rich. What happens to Alice next? Well, we don't really know what happened in the in the years afterwards. We, we know what her father did, but all we can say is maybe he did, maybe she did. But by the time of 1422, that's almost certainly very shortly after Henry V died, she married again. And then she was 18, so a more normal age, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And she married an earl, uh, actually the Earl of Salisbury, Thomas Montecute if you speak it in the Latin way. And an earl for a common-born woman or girl was unusual, very unusual. And, okay, she was rich from her first marriage, and she was Thomas Chaucer's only child, and he was rich too, so there was a lot of money. But there would have been other moneyed ladies, so we don't actually know why, why Thomas chose to marry her. It was probably, it was some sort of political decision, but uh, this is a bit of a mystery because we just do not know. But at the age of 18, she married again, and then she was a countess, which was already quite a step for a common-born girl. Yes, I mean, this is a textbook way of rising up through the ranks for a woman at this time. Marry, get rich, marry better, get rich again. Yes. <laughs> Now, Salisbury himself was actually a really important figure in the Hundred Years' War. Do you want to tell us a little bit about his career? Yes. Um, well, he was actually, he was a rebel son because his father had supported Richard II and he had been killed for it actually by a mob. But maybe, maybe that was in the back of his mind when Salisbury uh, <laughs> decided he'd better support Henry IV. And he, he became a warrior. And it's interesting because he was actually married to a woman, that's Eleanor Holland, who had been the niece of Richard II. So maybe he felt he's had something to prove. Yes. Uh, he'd become a father really early. So his daughter was almost exactly Alice's age. And she was called Alice too, because to make things yeah. more confusing. <laughs> uh, and he had been a, a very famous warrior at the time. Uh, even the French and the Burgundians were saying how, how he was such a great manly warrior, as, as you do. And he was quite ruthless, really. He uh, were stories about him leading prisoners of war uh, on a rope behind him. But it's not certain if those stories are uh, absolutely correct or if this was more of a metaphor of he, he knew how to lead his men and he had the needed brutality to do that. When he married Alice or shortly afterwards, he was actually the commander of the English forces in the Hundred Years' War. And he had a fairly important part in bringing Henry uh, V's body back to England. And it seems like shortly afterwards. So in that short time he stayed in England, after the funeral, he married Alice. Yes. And this is a time when things are still in a bit of upheaval. We do need to get to 
what happens after Henry V dies because Alice is so, her story is so tied up in Henry VI. But I think one more thing that I think is interesting about John of Salisbury is because this is the story about him that always sticks out in my mind is the way he dies, right? Because he Thomas, is Thomas Salisbury, but sorry, yeah. Thomas. Yeah, there's so many Salisburys as well. Thank you, Thomas Salisbury. He dies at the siege of Orleans, which is important for people to know because, of course, this is where Joan of Arc shows up. So how does Thomas, thank you, how does Thomas die? Actually, Thomas never even saw Joan of Arc. He died very, very early. He was the one who ordered the siege or who very strongly influenced it at the very least because he was the commander. And he was going to a tower overlooking Orleans to, to probably see where he could strategically put his soldiers in. And the uh, cannonball hit the tower and hit a window at behind he, uh, which he was standing, and it hit his, uh, his face and tore off one eye and the half of his face. And then he died eight days later. So, mm -hmm. so I hope he was unconscious that whole time. Oh, yeah. And so, of course, there's a lack of morale there in Orléans after this. Yes. A horrific, a horrific death. And I think that's why it stands out in my mind. So we can leave Joan of Arc out of the story for now. <laughs> Let's get back to Alice. Henry V has just died. And what happens next? Well, of course, Henry VI is a, is a very small child. He was eight months old, I think, or possibly nine. And of course, he had uh, inherited pretty much a poison chalice. Henry V had, of course, married the King of France's daughter, Catherine, and her brother had been disinherited. And uh, the, the Treaty of Troy said that when the French king died, then uh, Henry would inherit and his heirs after him, both England and France. Now, the French king promptly died only a month after Henry. And of course, uh, that technically meant that Henry VI was king of France and of England at the age of only nine months. But of course, his uncle, that's the king of France's son, wasn't taking that. He wasn't just stepping aside for a baby. So it must have seemed pretty settled at first for, for Henry V after signing that treaty, but his brother-in-law was fighting against him. And of course, there, there was a boost in French morale when, when the king died and his only heir was a baby. And there was naturally quite a lot of fighting going on again. And then there was Burgundy, we can't forget Burgundy, who liked mm -hmm. to play both sides a bit. And they originally decided with England. At the time that Alice married Salisbury, they sided with England. And there's, there's a fun story. Can I just tell that? Absolutely. There's, there's a fun yep. story that in like around two years after Alice married Salisbury, they were at a, at a wedding, at a Burgundian wedding of two nobles. And the, the Duke of Burgundy, that's Philip, was also there. And there's a French chronicler uh, describing how Philip was, he was a bit of a womanizer. And he, yes. he took a fancy to Alice, who was, he says, very beautiful. And Alice sent him just packing. So that's, that's, a, that's a commoner woman who just told a, a quasi-royal duke, yeah, go away, I don't want nothing to do with it. And, and Salisbury was angry, but only at the Duke of Burgundy. If you imagine like this medieval man, but he, he didn't play malice in the least bit. But he was angry at Salisbury, as, as you would be if somebody tries to talk up your wife while you're there. Uh -huh. And it's interesting because that same chronicler then says this this was what turned Salisbury against Burgundy and which made him then decide on the siege of Orleans four years later. So it, it, it's probably this story has a morale, medieval sort of thing, but still this is one source saying that Alice was, if not directly, still responsible for that huge siege of Orleans. That's... <laughs> Yes, it's probably one of those stories that, as you say, has at least been embellished a bit if it was true to begin with, but it is a good story. And I do think it's important to think about this stuff because when it comes down to it, the people who are ordering sieges are people. The people who are making alliances in this Hundred Years War, they're people and they do have a lot of animosity for whatever reason or friendship, and we, we never actually really know what that is. So these stories are always a fun way to get at what might have happened. Yeah. <laughs> so Alice and her marriage to Salisbury lasts longer, for sure, than her first marriage, but it still doesn't last all that long, does it? Six years, yeah. pretty exactly, yeah. And they didn't have any children either, if I'm remembering correctly. Actually, yes, she did. did. 
there's some indications that she had a daughter born after his death, just uh, five, six months later. There's some complicated legal stuff about the inheritance with Salisbury's older daughter and who gets what, when, and then the daughter died at the age of around six or seven. And the lands that had been held by William de la Pole for his stepdaughter were given to a Salisbury's older daughter then. Uh, okay. but, but Ellie, we, we know she existed, but we don't know the name or anything. She was probably called Alice. <laughs> Isn't everybody here? Yes. Right? Well, see, this is what happens when I talk to you before your book actually comes out. <laughs> so unfortunately for Alice, Salisbury dies in a really horrific way in Orléans. But one of the things I think is interesting about Salisbury is the way he lays things out for her in his will, because isn't he quite generous to her in his will and suggests that she can be buried next to him if she chooses to? Yes, so she- uh, he has had a grave ready made with his first wife, and he says, then maybe if you want to, you can also lie there. Generous, I guess. <laughs> and he left her half of his possessions, both his lands and his personal belongings. And there's also, there's at least one recorded gift of a of a great jewel to her. So he was spoiling her a bit. <laughs> well, she was beautiful and he didn't want her to run away with the Duke of Burgundy, I suppose. Probably, yeah. <laughs> so Alice's next marriage is her longest and probably the most influential when we think of how she managed her property her estates and things like this so her next marriage is to and we've talked about this already William de la Pole. so how does that happen we actually do not know because William de la Pole was Salisbury's second in command so he over, uh, took over the army uh, so to speak and then we all know how the uh, siege of Orleans ended and he and uh, two of his brothers one died and he and John, John de la Pole, that's his brother, were captured. And there's a great story about that too. It's also probably fake, but it's also a great story <laughs> that he uh, refused to surrender to any Frenchman but Joan of Arc herself because she was the bravest woman in uh, the whole world. And I'm, I'm just <laughs> imagining Joan uh, grumpily walking there because some Englishmen can't be bothered to surrender to anyone else. <laughs> that sounds about right to me, yeah. So he was taken prisoner and he lived with the bastard of Orléans. That's the Duke of Orléans' brother. And the Duke of Orléans was still in England. It's all a bit confusing. And he he became his his prisoner. Now, when we think of prisoner, we think of prison cells. And he would have been an honored prisoner. He, He would have had servants and probably lived better than most people at the time. Mm-hmm. But it must have been while he was still imprisoned that he actually arranged to marry Alice because they married a month, maybe two, three at the most after he was released. So we do not know who started it, whose idea it was. I'm guessing Alice because she didn't really have to gain a lot by that marriage at that point. She was actually richer than William himself and she Mm -hmm. was a countess. So there was no, no steep rise in it for her. And it's often said that she may have wanted children and this is probably true, but she did have a child. So it wasn't just that, I guess. I think that tells us a couple of things. First of all, that it's really hard to track children, especially girls in the Middle Ages. And then the other thing that being captured as a prisoner of war was not a stain on your character. So it wasn't something that Alice would have to worry about William being captured in war. He was still totally respectable as a marriage partner after that. Absolutely, yeah. Actually, when he married the as it was normal, the bastard of Orleans uh, demanded a, a pretty high sum. And he hadn't actually yet paid it by the time he wanted to marry. So uh, his brother, that's William's brother, Thomas, took over his, his place as prisoner until he had paid it. Oh, that's very generous. Taking over so your brother can get married. And how is this marriage for Alice? I know it's very difficult to actually see if a relationship is good. But how was it for Alice? Was it a beneficial relationship for her? It seems that way. But another interesting bit is we, we actually still have the marriage contract they made. And it's it's pretty much uh, he had no rights except when he asked her. It's, it was her money and it stayed her money. So whatever she made that marriage, if it was affection or not, she went in clear right. Well, I mean, she had already been widowed twice. <laughs> yes, it was quite clever. And it's interesting because he agreed to it, even though it meant that there wasn't really a lot of benefit for it. He got her connections, of course, but he was an earl. He could have had probably a better fiscal match, I guess. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah. he, he was actually, he had been Earl for at least 15 years by that time. Yeah, 15 years. And he had never married. So that's hmm. unusual. Interesting. Yeah, it is unusual. I mean, I suppose he's pretty busy in the Hundred Years' War as well. <laughs> yeah, he had at least one illegitimate daughter in his time in France. So it wasn't as he w- he was in- uninterested in women or something. He just didn't want to marry. Yeah, well, I think that as an Earl, you'd have to choose carefully. And Alice is a good match. As we've said, she's rich already. She's titled already. She's not going to put any weird pressure on him. Yeah. But William William got to be a pretty important man in Henry the Sixth court. We talked about Henry V. He's dead, and Henry the Sixth is growing up in the English court, which is a fraught place to grow up as a child king. And William kind of ascends in this court. So what was William's career like under Henry the Sixth? Well, at first, of course, the first round nine years, he, he was fighting in France, and he was imprisoned for Henry. So there, there's a lot of as you said, it wasn't a slight on his character. It was more like uh, he gave everything for his country and he lost three brothers in it mm-hmm. and his father. So he ha- I could say, all my family gave everything for you. And he, mm-hmm. he became quite close to Henry, although it was a lot of it was, at least for the first years, it was quite informal. I think he was something of a father figure for, for Henry VI. Maybe, maybe someone who was not as demanding as his uncles were, I could imagine. He helped him, and of course, later that he was accused of just uh, whispering in his ear what he wanted him to do. And I guess that's possible to some extent, but I, I would say he did what he thought was best for him and for the country. Whether or not it was, that's that's a different subject. <laughs> well, we had Lauren Johnson on the podcast to talk about Henry VI before, and the impression I have of Henry VI and always have is that he was just kind of a gentle soul, friendly, and so it makes sense to me that he would cling to a figure like William de la Pole and want to stick with him, want to listen to him, want to reward him as much as he could as the king. And so Alice is pretty well placed in the English court, but things are not perfect for the Delapole family, are they? No, they, they weren't. First of all, the Delapoles were not very rich. Alice herself was quite rich. But if you if you think of an earl and an earl who had a pretty prominent position at court, as they probably would just about cover the coasts. So there's, there's that. And then, of course, uh, there would always be jealousy. If somebody was close to the king, then somebody else is going to be jealous. And of course, I imagine they would have wanted children, but we we have some indications she had miscarriages, but she didn't have another child, a child with William for 11 years. So I guess that was also something that must have been a worry for her and probably also for William. Yes, because everyone knows that in Middle Ages, especially if you're rich, it's important to have an heir to take care of all of your properties and your money. So they did have a son eventually right yes that's john john de la pole uh, probably called after william's brother who uh, then married elizabeth the sister of edward the fourth and yes, they had 13 which... children and yeah <laughs> i do want to get to that too but poor alice her third husband also meets a very grisly end so what happens to william de la pole in the end well, he was very much involved in Henry the Sixth's marriage to Margaret of Anjou, which was a bit of a disaster, really. And mm-hmm. especially the, the peace treaty, the marriage treaty that was supposed to bring peace, it was pretty bad for England. They had to give up large parts of lands in France, and she didn't even have a dowry. And for a lot of English people, it seemed as if they got nothing. And then she also didn't have a child for pretty long, so they didn't even get an heir out of it. And as was usual at the time, you didn't really blame the king himself. So yeah. he blamed his closest advisor. That's William. And mm-hmm. there's also, uh, it's it's debated, but there's a suggestion at the very least that some of William's enemies at court, especially Richard, Duke of York, they uh, they stoked a bit of the ill feeling towards him. And, and in the end, it was so bad. The bishop who married Henry and Margaret and William's treasurer was murdered and then... Um, Henry VI pretty much had no choice if he wanted to keep his throne to arrest William. And he was accused of treason, but he was actually not declared guilty. He was uh, declared guilty of a a lesser charge and sentenced to exile for five years. And it was almost certainly some sort of protective custody thing. Get you Mm -hmm. out of here for the next five years until then they have found someone else to be angry at. 
William was captured on his way to, to exile, uh, taken from a boat and beheaded. Quite grisly, there is a pastel letter about it saying that he was threatened with torture if he didn't comply and then he was beheaded with a rusty sword. Again, how much of that is actually true is debatable, but well, he was definitely beheaded. Yes. And things that come from the past in family are not going to be necessarily complementary to the Della Polo family, which we can get into in a minute. So after all this, Alice is widowed again. But I do want to come back to the connection to Margaret of Anjou, which I probably should have done a little bit earlier. So Alice was pretty instrumental in bringing Margaret of Anjou back to England from France. So this is something a marriage that had been orchestrated in large part by her husband. And William was actually the person who stood as a proxy for Henry VI, wasn't he? Yes. During their marriage? Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, Margaret and, and William had a proxy marriage. Um, William stood in for Henry VI, so she was married before she left for England. This was some sort of a security measure. It also was done, for example, for Mary Tudor when she married the King of France. It's just like, she's already married. You can't stop this marriage by abducting her or something like that. And William was then the man who, who took Henry VI part. And actually, Alice was quite instrumental because, uh, of course, there were uh, when when she made her way to England, there were celebrations. And one time Margaret was sick and she had been meant to have a great procession into, into Rouen, I think it was. And so Alice actually took over her part in dressed in, in fine regal clothing and waving to the people. That's uh, <laughs> uh, pr basically pretending to be Margaret, which is really a step. If you imagine this was a woman who was born a commoner, even if a rich one, and then she, there she was in full queenly dress pretending to be an actual queen. That's unimaginable. That's something that you could put in the movie, which I think is why <laughs> you're always on Twitter saying we need to talk about Alice. Alice was so, amazing. <laughs> so Alice is very close to Margaret, I think, in part because Margaret was so young too, coming across for her marriage. So these two they spent a lot of time together on that journey, didn't they? Yes, they did. I think, uh, again, uh, she was probably a bit of a, of a mother figure for her. And she was almost the same age that Alice's daughter by Salisbury had been. So I guess that, that would have been something that Alice at the least had in the back of her mind. Alice seems to have told her the ropes and the going ons on in the court and, and what to expect and who was what. And this was, she was later actually accused of that, of turning her against some people who felt like they should have a better place at court and things like that. And I guess she probably did, even if you are trying to be unbiased, if you are talking about people, you, your opinion is going to be noticeable. Yes. But there's actually no suggestion that she deliberately uh, excluded anyone. And I mean, Margaret was young when she came over, but she didn't stay young forever. So she could make her <laughs> own decisions at some point. Absolutely. Margaret made a lot of her own decisions for better and for worse. Yeah. And so they were very directly aligned, as you said, with, with Alice's family. It starts to separate in sort of factions as the Wars of the Roses start to begin. And so yes. Alice is firmly on the side of Margaret, but that changes, doesn't yes. it? Actually, it's, a comment I wanted to make because it's kind of sexist and you see it a lot. There's this idea and it was first put about by Shakespeare that, that William and Margaret were some sort of a couple or had an affair. And mm. it, you see it a lot still. And you, you even see it like she, she was close to Alice because it was her way to be close to William. And it just sells Alice short because she was pretty amazing in her own right. It wasn't just to be close to a man or because of a man. Mm -hmm. and it's quite sad that you still see it a lot. Yeah, I think that people are always trying to couple everyone up. And hopefully we're not making the same sort of assumptions now. But anyway, I wanted to say that because it's something that, that I noticed a lot and it annoyed me. It would annoy me too, especially if there's no reason for it, no basis for it, except for no, the fact actually, that... Actually, William was really close to Alice. There's, uh, we have his will still and he's he's all over her. And uh, so there's there's actually no reason at all to imagine that, that he would have been even interested in Margaret. This is always sort of assumed that if she wanted, he would. But there is no evidence. Yes. Plus, I think there is some evidence that Margaret was trying hard to have a relationship with Henry VI as well, at least in the early years before he started to have his mental health issues. But yeah, it's always uh, presented as this huge disaster. And I guess politically it was, but they seem to get on well enough. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Just my own opinion is not very deep, but it always seemed to me like she regarded him as some sort of vulnerable younger brother mm -hmm. more than a husband, which is probably not helpful if you're trying to be a queen and have many children. But personally, <laughs> it's not, not the worst that could happen. Yeah, I think that there was definitely affection, no matter how that seemed to work out. And it would also have been a very bad move on Margaret's part as someone who is already disliked as not being from England to start having an affair yeah. with, you know, the King's closest advisor. So I'm glad that you mentioned it because I think this kind of uh, matchmaking really colors a lot of historical accounts yeah. uh, and it's not necessarily based on anything half the time. All right. So eventually Alice does jump ship from the Lancasters to the York. So how does that happen? Well, there's evidence that there was some sort of a rift after William's death because it was still very fraught and the Jack Kate rebellion happened. And that's uh, when Alice was accused of treason by, by the rebels. And if that had actually succeeded, it would have gone very badly for her. But Henry VI and Margaret still had to find some way to calm everybody down again. And Alice and her son had a bit of a problem with that because it meant taking a lot of presents that... Henry had made William again away again. And so I guess Alice wasn't best pleased about her son not receiving this. She may have understood the reason why, but still. Then John had been married shortly before his father's death to Margaret Beaufort. That's the future mm -hmm. mother of Henry VII. And mm -hmm. then the marriage was three years later. It was annulled. And uh, Margaret was married to Henry VI's half-brother. That's Edmund Tudor. And mm -hmm. she may have also not liked that. This, this sort of, yeah, I'm taking him from your son. He doesn't doesn't need that anymore. So she was looking around for another match for him. And so she eventually decided uh, on the Duke of uh, York's second daughter, Elizabeth. And they married when, when Alice's son was around 15 and she was around 13. Interestingly, again, the peasants are not the most, shall I say, reliable source on, on Alice, but this seems fairly likely. It was still recorded that Alice was close to Margaret after that. So it's maybe not the immediate rejection that we tend to see. Maybe Margaret understood that Alice wanted to do everything for her son. That's mm -hmm. first and foremost in any mother's mind. But however it was, however it turned out, when the Yorkists won, Alice was still on top of everything. So she managed that quite well. Yes, I don't think that anyone really believed at that point that they were going to, the Yorks were going to supplant the reigning king, even though he was having difficulties. But that's how it happened. So Alice is all of a sudden mother in law to the sister of the king, yeah. Edward the Fourth. Actually, it's so, interesting yeah. because, of course, Richard, Duke of York, uh, died in, in the Battle of Wakefield in uh, 1460. And John, John was 18, that's Alice's son, was 18 by that time. And there was even, there are letters surviving saying he should decide on a side finally. Mm -hmm. But he didn't until Richard of York had died. And then he did. And uh, there's this suggestion that he believed that the Duke of York was responsible for his father's death. So he wouldn't fight for him. He would fight for his son, that's fine, but but not for him. That makes sense to me because Richard of York was causing all sorts of trouble in the court before that. So yeah, I could understand why John would Actually, take that an, stance. An interesting story because of course, after the Battle of Wakefield, that's the uh, end of December and John began gathering his men and he first fought at, I think it was the Battle of Mortimer in the middle of February. There was a battle in the beginning of February, but I keep forgetting the names, which it was. And he wasn't yet ready for, for fighting. That's, that's clear. He needs time to, to gather his men. But anyway, his first child was born at the beginning of November. So we can make a deduction of what he was doing mm -hmm. instead of fighting. <laughs> Again, you have to pay attention to the human element here because it is really uh, influential, just as it is in our own lives. <laughs> yes, and it's, it's very human, isn't it? Like maybe he was thinking he doesn't know how it turns out. So make the best yeah. of it while you can. <laughs> It's true. Exactly. It's true. So we talked a few minutes ago, well, a couple of times about how the Pastons are not a reliable source. So Alice is in her third widowhood. Things are going well for her. She's a mother-in-law to a princess and she's got all sorts of property all over the place. But the Pastons for one family are not 
all that thrilled about it. So what's going on between Alice and the past and family? Basically land disputes or property disputes. They were already going on when William de la Pole was still alive and they were going on uh, long after Alice was dead. There was especially some manners. This probably not all that expensive, not all worth all that trouble, but they were fighting about them all the time for over, over decades. And mm -hmm. they were accusing each other of all sorts of crimes for it. You stole my sheep, you broke into my house. And actually, Alice, even when she was quite old, even when she was in her 60s, Margaret Parson was always saying it was her. Her son did that because <laughs> she said so. And there's, there's one really funny letter of Margaret telling her son, also called John, because of course, yeah. if you are uh, going to... Um, to negotiate with her, bring somebody with you, because if not, she's going to con you into something you really do not want. You know, she's got almost a supernatural power, this Alice. <laughs> so you can see why the past in letters are not good representations, perhaps, of the full truth of what's going on in Alice's life over time. No, it's sad because we only know their, their point of view of that whole quarrel. Yes. So Alice has a really long life and she's administering these properties. She's got lots of grandkids. <laughs> she eventually does die. Can you tell us a little bit about the end of Alice's life? Well, uh, she she seems to have died of quite natural causes, maybe old age. She was 17 or 71. We, we don't know exactly. She died in uh, 1475 in May. And depending on when in 14 or 4 she was born, that she was 70 or 71, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's a grant from the Pope for her around three months before she died, saying she was old and broken with age and giving her permission for to have an altar in her room or something like that. So mm -hmm. she, she must have, it wasn't suddenly when she died. There's also um, a letter from her to William Stoner. That's the other, the Stoner letters. And yes. actually, uh, William Stoner was William de la Pole's grandson. And the son of his illegitimate daughter got in, got in France. And mm -hmm. she was saying she wants to, this is around March or April, she wants to speak to him about something regarding the future. So she was probably making arrangements there for what happens when she dies. And then she died in probably in May. May is what her, her absolutely amazing tomb says. But the Inquisition's post-mortem, they say June. Yeah. Well, I mean, the tomb was made by her son, so I guess he knew when she died, but it's just a point worthy of note that it's it's not agreed on. Yes, and her tomb is really interesting. So let's talk about that for a second. But the one of the things I think is most interesting is she had three husbands. She decided not to get buried next to any of them. She has her own tomb. But let's talk about her tomb for a sec, because it's really interesting. Yes, it's it's great. It's in well, well, is that how you pronounce it? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, this is where where she seems to have spent most of her adult life and even most of her childhood. Actually, she got it from her mother, and her her parents are buried there, and she chose to be buried there too. And this is a brilliant tomb. It's, it's a so called Ramsey tomb, where very famous and very uh, very coveted at the time. But it's one of the few examples that still survive. On on the top of it is an effigy of her in a fine dress and uh, full glory, and then beneath it is an effigy of, of a decaying corpse. And it's, mm -hmm. it's brilliantly done. It's absolutely creepy, but it's really lifelike. <laughs> yes, these uh, transi tombs or cadaver tombs were meant to have the people who are looking at them remember that they will be one day a corpse as well. So you have Alice looking beautiful and you have Alice looking like a, well, a corpse. It's, it's really beautiful. It's interesting because you have her effigy and it's very lifelike. So you can imagine it was probably work for life. And we have the effigy of her son that's in Wingfield and they look so similar. It's not even <laughs> the same stonemason or something. It's different styles, but they look very, very similar. So this is interesting. It could actually be work from life and they just resemble each other a lot. That's nice to think of, I think. So as we wrap up, what are the things that you would like people to remember about Alice? Because you're you're definitely a huge Alice advocate. So we've talked a little bit about her biographical details, but what do you want people to know about Alice? I think I want um, to know that she was really powerful in her own right. It's not just uh, her father, her husband, uh, her son, but she was powerful by herself. She was admired and she was sometimes uh, despised and she was powerful because she was Alice and not because she was Thomas's daughter or William's wife or something. 
And there's also, I, I would like to remember this, this human element uh, that she had quite a lot of humor. For example, there survives a letter from her to some servant and she calls him cock, by which she means hothead, not anything else. So, so she was like, dear hothead, would you please? Uh, so this is also something. She she was really, she was a woman. She was alive. She had some she likes and dislikes. She had a sense of humor, that sort of thing. That's also very important to me. And of course, it, it also shows what women could and did achieve in the 15th century, not just like the typical, she was a pawn, she couldn't do that, she had to go there and or not go there. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was born a commoner, a rich commoner, but a commoner, and then she ended up a uh, dowager, duchess, if that's how you pronounce it. Dowager. Dowager, yeah. duchess. And she was a mother-in-law to a princess, and her grandson was technically king by law for five months or something. So this is the, this huge rise that was yeah. possible for her, and then she managed to stay on top all the time. <laughs> Which is difficult to do, especially during the, both the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses. So pretty fabulous, especially as the granddaughter of a poet who was himself the son of uh, vintners, I think, wine merchant. So, yes, wine merchant. So this is quite the story, Alice's. Oh, and we should probably mention that she was also a patron of the arts. She supported Lydgate. He actually dedicated one of his works to her. That's Virtues of the Mass, I think. Yes, and yeah, then I think William so. de la Pole, who wrote all sorts of poems to her in French and in English. <laughs> oh, see, a devoted husband. I love it. <laughs> okay, so you've been advocating for Alice all over Twitter, but you actually have a book on Alice that's coming out. Can you tell us when that's going to come out and who is publishing it? It's published by Emily Publishing, and it will probably be out February or March next year. Should have been out end of this year, but you know, all the COVID things, it's yes. been delayed. Yes, absolutely. I think most of the publications are delayed. So we will have to look forward to that in the early part of next year. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for coming on and talking to us about Alice. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. To find out more about Michelle's work, you can follow her on Twitter at flovelinfo. That's F-L-O-V-E-L-L-I-N-F-O. And keep an eye out for what is better than a good woman, Alice Chaucer commoner and Yorkist matriarch, which comes out next year. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, the big news this week is about the Vinland map. It's a fake. <gasps> what? Yes, yes. So the, the good people at Yale University have kind of been studying their map for a long time. And now they've uh, said that there's titanium in ink. And that titanium was made in the 1920s. Oh, wow. That's a shocker. 1920s isn't the 1520s. So <laughs> not good. Not good. So we're actually getting in touch with people at Yale about it. And we'll see all the details, all the delicious details. And by the time this podcast is out, we should have all the news for you. But if you have that one of those nice like Vinland maps up on your wall, you might as well take it down and throw it in the trash. But I wouldn't go that far. It's still fun to have on the wall. <laughs> oh, that will be on the site. But right now you can see uh, Catherine Walton. And she has a piece about everyday magic in the Middle Ages, like healing and protection spells, using things like amulets. And we're also staying in a magical uh, realm with Elizabeth Smith Rosser. And she do, uh, has an article on this Chinese wizard and the man who went to kind of find him in the 12th century. Nice little story Ooh, there. I like these stories. That's exciting. We have to all check this out, I think. Indeed, indeed. Or poof, be gone. <laughs> all right. And with that, poof, you're gone. See you later, Peter. Bye. Thank you, as always, to our patrons on patreon.com for all your support. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast can choose from all sorts of wonderful stuff like our subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval Magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. To find out how to become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. September means it's back to class. The Medieval Masterclass for Creators, that is. This is a six-week online course that I put together with some amazing experts to help people creating medieval fiction to get all those little details that they need without having to spend hours lost on the internet. 
We cover everything from cooking to combat, blacksmithing to textile work, and we do it all with video demonstrations, helpful bibliographies, recipes, and writing prompts. And you can even ask me anything. The next class begins Friday, September 17th. For all the details, please visit MedievalMasterclass.com. For everything from maps to minstrels, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find all my books at your favorite online bookstores, where you can even pre-order the new one, How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, which comes out in October. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Music